I want to say thank you to the Institute um, here at the Center for uh, Urban History. I was here five years ago um, in the middle of my sabbatical when I was researching Stefan Dubnitsky. And it was really thanks to the generosity in the middle of a revolution um, and the courage of a lot of people that I met um, that I was inspired to finish this project. And the result of it is a story, I think, of Ukrainian history, uh, which is not just about one cartographer, one geographer, but really, I think, um, since Stefan Rudnitsky was such an unusual person, um, his mother was Armenian and his father was German, uh, because he was so unusual, I think the book became a story of many individuals um, who became leading national cartographers, so to say. Um, and I have five of those characters in the book, which I'll talk about. I had a sixth, the Belarusian Arkad Smolich. Um, I'm going to leave him for another date and maybe another book at another time. Uh, but I want to talk to you today about the people I call map men and their transnational lives across borders, across nations and nationalisms, and in the world of colonial empires before World War II. Let me begin with the character of Stefan Rudnitsky and his maps. With aims to forge a country called Ukraine from empires before 1914, Stepan Lvovich Rudnitsky was a rival of Elgenia Schromer in Poland and a student of Albrecht Henk. That he originated from East Galicia and was a Ruthenian in the German or Austrian designation, not of noble origin, was something that mattered significantly. Her ma his maps were what I would call naturalist and realist not surrealist, at least not yet. Um, what you will see here is, at the top, the surrealist map of the world, drawn in 1929, as a kind of joke. Um, we're not quite to the world of irony, at least not yet. At the bottom was um, a graphic artist's design for a map of Hungary after Trianon, the Treaty of Trianon in 1920. I want to argue today that maps have multiple purposes. And through the character of Rudnitsky and the world of Ukrainian geography and cartography, we can begin to sort that out. Stepan's branch of the Rudnitsky family came from a village not far from Ternopil. <coughs> And his grandfather, Denis, was a Greek Catholic priest. His father, Lev, born in 1851, completed gymnasium in Berejane and studied in Vienna and Lviv, Lemberg, Vuv. His learned father, who earned a degree in German and in history and geography, became a director in Halicina of classical gymnasium, and Stepan's father, moved with the family to Peremishu, Lviv, Ternopil, and then back to Lviv in 1891. A little bit of family history, because I think we need as historians to study not just maps, but also lives and deaths. Lev married a woman named Emilia Taborska in 1874. She was of Armenian, background, extraction, and she also came from a Ruthenian Catholic family of priests. Stepan, born in Peremishul in 1877, was closest emotionally, I think, to his mother, who managed the household and encouraged all four of her children to learn Ukrainian and German and pursue higher intellectual paths. Now, I want to make a different kind of argument, and this is my attempt to be a little bit provocative. I want to say that Stepan Rudnitsky was not Ukrainian. 
What I mean by that is that he embodied Habsburg, Austro-Hungarian, German, imperial, and colonial diversity. So let's put Brudnitsky together in a lineup here in my chapter one of what I call the map men who were the pupils of Professor Albert Henck, one of the world's most famous geographers, the chair of geography like Karl Ritter had been the chair of geography in Berlin and Vienna. Back to Rudnitsky along with these men. The Rudnitsky family struggled in the 1890s and 1900s in Habsburg, Galicia. The family suffered tragedy twice. First in 1896, when Emilia Taborska Rudnitska died of tuberculosis. Two years later, Stepan's father in 1898 had a fatal heart attack. And so at the start of a new century, full of optimism and toasts to the world, in 1900, Stepan, together with his older brother, Levko, had to care for their younger siblings, their sisters and brothers. The household of the parents had been busy and intellectually ambitious. But in this world, nationalities, ethnic identity, and labels was as much of a factor as performed social roles, intra-family roles, the emotional worlds of maps and map men. Now, let me turn away from Rudnitsky for just a moment to some of our other characters. Rudnitsky is a person who comes out of Ost-Mittel-Europa, out of East-Central Europe, which I think is very vaguely defined, but I'll just talk about it as a concept and then come back to it. The person who became one of the most influential men who drew the lines after empire was Isaiah Bowman in the United States. A little bit about him. Bowman was the chief territorial specialist for the United States, handpicked by President Woodrow Wilson and one of his political men, politicos, his name was Colonel House. Bowman was a geographer who studied at Harvard and Yale he had corresponded with Albrecht Penck before the war, and he became the most friendly American geographer to the Polish, not Ukrainian, cause. So map men number two, who was he? Isaiah Bowman was born in poverty in Canada and became naturalized as a US citizen in 1899. His ticket to the Ivy League was something of a miracle. The person who discovered his talent had been a master's student of Albrecht Penck, a man by the name of Mark Jefferson, trained as a cartographer. And it was Jefferson who sent Bowman to Harvard so, Bowman worked at Harvard. Bowman met Pink at Harvard. And Bowman also became not a friend of Rudnitsky, but a friend of Elgenius Romer. He will be my third map man, and I'll return to him in a little while. Why was Bowman so important? Bowman mastered the language of cartography. He said, quote, a new instrument was discovered referring to the world of peace process after World War I. The map language. A map, wrote Bowman, was as good as a brilliant poster. And just being a map made it respectable, authentic. A perverted map was a life belt to many a foundering argument. And I want to em emphasize this point 
about foundering arguments, weak arguments. Because these, I think, are what maps generally support. Isaiah Bowman was an expert on settlement issues. He knew not one Slavic language. He had no knowledge of Polish, no knowledge of Ukrainian or Russian or Czech or Serbian or Bosnian or Bulgarian or anything. He knew German and a little bit of French and some Spanish because he had been an expert on South America. Now this is the person who very influentially is responsible from the American side as the chief territorial specialist for drawing half of the European continent. Bowman, as I mentioned, had studied with Mark Jefferson and the geographer William Morris Davis. He was one of the world's leading geomorphologists, a competitor to Pink. Bowman, in 1915, became the director of the American Geographical Society. So here's where our world of geographers and cartographers becomes a 19th century world of transnational science and contact. As you know, there were other geographical societies in the world. The first had been founded in Paris in 1821. The second had been founded in 1828 by Karl Ritter. The third was the Royal Geographical Society in London. And the fourth was the Imperial Russian Geographical Society in St. Petersburg, founded 1845. So Bowman became not just a geographer, but an institutionalized geographer, a map man. In, 18, in 1918, he caught another break, and he was appointed as the chief territorial specialist of President Woodrow Wilson's inquiry, the Committee to Negotiate Peace for Preparation in Paris. And so in 1918, after Wilson's speech about national self-determination, uh, in preparation for the end of the war, the 14 points. It was Bowman who supported the establishment of Poland as a state, but not Ukraine. So now we have two map men in crossing paths intellectually and politically. Bowman, as I mentioned, was responsible for gathering all of the maps and information for the Americans in 1919. He had two Polish geographers working for him, and in effect, they were also working for Eugenia Romer, who was in Paris at the conference. Where was Stefan Rudnitsky? I think the question of Rudnitsky is incredibly important in the 1900s and 19-teens. What he was doing, how he was becoming professionalized as a Ukrainian geographer. As I mentioned, the Rudnitsky family had suffered a number of tragedies. Rudnitsky had lost his mother and his father in the late 1890s. Rudnitsky worked, was accepted into the philosophy department in Lviv in 1895-96. And he read everything, everything. To finance his studies, to follow his father's path and belief in Bildung and education in the German sense, but also in the Ruthenian sense, Stepan being without much money, gave lessons in history, geography, and of course, German. He gave those lessons to children of rather comfortable Polish families, families like the Romers. 
Somewhere along the line, by 1900, Rudnitsky found his talent for drawing and for geography. And I would also argue that there's really nothing special about maps. Yes, they're drawn to scale, but they're pictures. They're drawings. Rudnitsky also, and here's an important question for Ukrainian history, found a patron. Geographers, mapmen, cartographers need patrons. It's expensive to produce an atlas. The first one was made, the first national atlas was made in Helsinki by the Finns in 1899. So, Rudnitsky had a very valuable patron, and his name was Mikhailo Kruszewski. Kruszewski, as we all know, was the president of the Shevchenko Scientific Society in Tisha, and he believed in Rudnitsky's scientific work, Wissenschaft, Nauka. Kruszewski was the charismatic force at the turn of the 20th century, behind not just the Entisha, but he also had did Kruszewski correspondences with European academies of sciences, and he sought to gather new professionals, not just historians and authors, writers, but professional technical intelligentsia into Ukrainian studies. And this is where Rudnitsky caught his break. In 1899, the same year that the first national atlas in Eastern Europe, we count Finland in the category of East Central Europe, was published, Rudnitsky was studying geomorphology, oceanography, and orography. He studied in Lviv, with Antony Rema, the same geographer who was training Eugenius Romer. Antony Rema supervised Stefan's thesis in climatology. Now, you might think climatology is somewhat boring, but climatology was in an enormous demand in the 1890s. And this was a real breakthrough for Rudnitsky. He published his first major scientific article about climatology in Polish, in the journal Cosmos. Then it became part of the Entishaw's journal in Ukraine. Now here is an interesting moment. Raymond, who was rather liberal in his outlook, believed in sending Ukrainian and the Polish students abroad to study. Raymond found money for Rudnitsky, a stipendia. And so Raymond sent Rudnitsky to study with Albrecht Penck, back to our Penck here, when Penck was a professor in Vienna. And Penck had been a professor in Vienna until he moved to Berlin in 1906. So, Rudnitsky gets his advanced education, training, postgraduate work in anthropogeography, in climatology, in geomorphology, and he reads everything in German, French, Polish, Ukrainian, and Russian. As Stepan Rudnitsky publishes or begins to publish his articles, it earns him full membership in the Entisha, which is like a European Academy of Sciences. And so Rudnitsky, by the middle of the 1900s, is dreaming of a national school of geography and cartography. And this in Ostmittel Europa would not just be Ukrainian, remember he was both German and Armenian, but it would be a professionalization and nationalization of geography. The project of Stepan Rudnitsky was to expand Ukrainian studies into geography and geography into all of the following subfields. Climatology, meteorology, 
Glaciology, yes, there are glaciers still left in the world. Oceanography, earth magnetism, volcanology or volcanism, and hydrography. In other words, the earth sciences. Okay. So now I've talked about Stepan Rudnitsky and Isaiah Bowman. Um, I'll just pause for a moment here and let you focus on some of the maps drawn by Rudnitsky, since this is a talk not just about the sciences of geography, but also about cartographers. So, um, Das Wohngebiet der Ukraine in Europa, this is uh, one of Rudnitsky's maps, which became um, influential in the Ukrainian diaspora. It was first published in German, and uh, his book was then translated on Ukrainian geography and Ukrainian history um, into English and published in New Jersey in 1915. Note the point here about settlement. This is a colonial geography in black and white. Now the colors. Rudnitsky's ethnographic survey map of Ukraine, Ethnographische Übersichtskarte der Ukraine, also published in German. In pink, that great color of British imperial dominions, note the extension of Ukrainian territory in the map. It is including not just Crimea, the Crimean Peninsula, but also going into Lebensraum, into living space, pushing to the east into the Kuban. In short, Rudnitsky used his scientific knowledge gained during the 1900s and 19-teens, when Friedrich Ratzel was in full vogue in order to draw some of the very first maps in Ukrainian. He focused on ethnography. He focused on political borders. He focused on soil science, which I think is especially important for both the history of Ukrainian and Belarusian geographer. The Belarusian soil scientist's name, as I mentioned, was Arkad Smolich. So it's not just nationalities that Rudnitsky is interested in but certainly it's nationalities that become one of the main focuses of his outlook for drawing and advertising maps of Ukraine, Ukrainian lands to the world. Um, these maps were also not just according to language reduced to nationality, but also according to race. So, um, sorry, you can't really see it here, but uh, in this part, the racial and national boundaries in Central Europe, um, this is something that Rudnitsky is focusing on. The categories that he has, the categories, the categories that Rudnitsky is including um, are mostly categories drawn according to race or language. He does not consider Jews in this map. There are no Jewish populations listed. Okay. Sorry. So let's go back to the 1900s and 19-teens. There are a lot of different ways of interpreting these maps. Can we say simply that Rudnitsky was a nationalist or a racist? Well, yes. But it doesn't take us very far because racial discourse, discourse according to nationality, was very much part of this tradition of Austro-Hungarian and Central European mapping. I think it's an interesting question. Let me focus on some of the obstacles Stepan Rudnitsky had. Out of transnational Galicia, in 1902, the Shevchenko Scientific Society petitioned Vienna, that is, petitioned the seat of the Habsburg Empire, to set up a Ukrainian university. This, as we know, is Ivan Franko, 
today. Polls blocked the initiative. As a result, Rudnitsky, with his project to create Ukrainian geography, had to take a secondary teaching job for geography and history in Ternopil. He could not pursue his habilitation in the German tradition. He continued his scientific research, went on expeditions in 1904 and 1905, studied geomorphology. In 1907, Rudnitsky began drafting the first ethnographic map of Ukrainian population dispersals. And it's from this period of time, 1905, 1906, 1907, in context, that we get these maps. So, remember the context here. Rudnitsky can't pursue a doctorate. Rudnitsky can't be part of a Ukrainian-speaking Ukrainophone university in V. When Rudnitsky, in 1907, begins drafting these maps as a project for the Shevchenko Scientific Society, it provokes the suspicions of Evgenyush Romer. Now, I want to talk about Romer. This confrontation between Rudnitsky and Romer in 1908, a very pointed exchange, was one in which Romer, the Pole, denied Rudnitsky, the Ukrainian, the ability to be an academic geographer. Now, Romer was fluent in German, just as Stefan Rudnitsky was. The difference being, Romer had come from a Schlachta family, an influential Polish family in the Rzeczpospolita, all the way back to the 15th century. So here is a confrontation. Okay. Let me talk a little bit about Eugenia Schromer. I want to argue that Romer and Rudnitsky shared not just objective, neutral, scientific paths to produce maps, but they had a shared emotional world. And that was the world of East Central Europe, where they had their lives and their deaths. Romer came from a mixed Schlachta family. His father, Edmund Romer, was a lawyer and a civil servant in Galicia. Um, Romer's uncle had taken part in the 1863 uprising, um, but his father, Edmund, was much more conservative um, and was a kind of loyalist to the emperor, a lawyer, a civil servant, um, when Romer writes about his father in his memoirs, he describes his um, father as, uh, in Polish, I think the phrase is zupełnie zgimanizowane, completely Germanized. Anyway, Romer is Rudnitsky's rival. He studied geography in Vienna on exchange abroad with, you guessed it, back to that guy, Albrecht Heng. Romer was also married, and he married into money. His wife was Jadwiga Rosknecht, the heiress to the Okochim beer, to the Okochim brewery. And so for a declining Schlachta family, this was not a bad decision, if one looks at it financially. While Romer denied Rudnitsky's credentials, in other words, tried to prevent the development of Ukrainian geography, he himself was raised to the position of the chair of geography at the university in Lviv, Lviv, Lemberg, Leopold. And so from this position, when Romer becomes the chair of geography, the same position held by William Morris Davis at Harvard, and Albrecht Penck in Berlin. Romer uses this position in order to develop the most influential maps of Poland. And those maps in the West, in London, in Paris, and Washington especially, became much more influential than Rudnitsky's. Here, 
probably, in 1916, is the most important cartographic work ever produced out of Eastern Europe. I, I don't like to make exaggerations. But it was this atlas, Geograficzno Statistyczne Atlas Polski, that Romer prepared in Krakow, had published in Vienna with the support of the Habsburg family, Wilhelm von Habsburg. It was in Vienna that Romer avoided arrest during World War I. Pink tried to have him arrested. Pink thought Romer was producing a work that was subversive, which of course it was during the middle of the war. And it was this atlas that Romer shipped across the Atlantic through neutral Switzerland into the hands of Woodrow Wilson himself. Romer sent it to Bowman. Bowman gave it to Wilson. And so these were the maps from the Geographical and Statistical Atlas of Poland, which became founding documents for Poland's independence after World War I. Now, by 1914, Rudnitsky saw for Ukraine in geography what Hrushevsky had located in history. Geography was a dream, and cartographers had future blueprints, future plans. Stepan Rudnitsky produced the first Ukrainian school atlas in 1917, uh, excuse me, 1912. Um, the first Ukrainian school atlas, first produced in 1912, was reprinted during the war in 1917, after the war in 1919, and again in 1926. When the war broke out in August of 1914, Rudnitsky had to flee from Lviv, and he left for Vienna. The end of Europe's empires, in the dynastic sense, gave to Stepan Rudnitsky an opportunity. It was not just a tragedy, but an opportunity to produce maps, pamphlets, and books for Ukrainian independence. In short, World War I made Stepan Rudnitsky's career. He became the world's leading geographic expert, professional and national, out of Ukraine. Now, remember some of the highlights here of my story, right? Back to our map men. These were the guys. Albrecht Pank, Chair of Geography, University of Berlin, since 1906. In fact, from 1906 until his retirement in 1926. Pank was conservative. He was folkish. He supported the Kaiser during World War I, and he supported Hitler during World War II. I write about this in my book. Romer, his politics are, I think, much harder to classify. Um, he was neither a supporter of Pilsudski <coughs> or Dmowski, but he believed, believed himself to be a kind of independent, objective, scientific expert. And when he drew maps of Poland, he wanted Poland to be as large as possible, right? You know this about Polish history. You know this probably about the Romer family. Um, the Romer family can trace its origins all the way back to um, the 15th century. They had estates around Jaswo. Um, the northern Romer family, which includes Nicolas Romeris, the Lithuanian um, lawyer after whom a university is named, they were cousins. That border goes all the way north um, into Lithuania near the Latvian border. So Romer's mental map, if you will, was of Poland not just before 1772, 
but Poland before 1654, maybe even Poland going all the way back to his family's settlement in Central and East European lands. Um, I haven't talked much about Count Paul Teleki, but if I have some time, I certainly will. Um, Paul Teleki, Paul Teleki uh, was from an old 17th generation Transylvanian family. He was second, uh, the Prime Minister of Hungary twice, and he was the author of the Carte Rouge, or Red Map, which was uh, on my first slide, the first map that I showed. Okay. So, I've talked a little bit now about maps. Here's just how bad some of the maps were. Remember my point here about Bowman. Bowman had no knowledge of any East European languages except for German. Bowman's resources were resources which were shipped to him like a geographical and statistical atlas sent to him by Romer. These were some of the maps that Bowman drew, and they were, until recently, secret maps just recently de declassified for the U.S. Committee to Negotiate Peace. You'll note here again the areas between Poland, Lithuania, Russia, Ukraine. In purple, I don't know if you can read it in English, but it says mixed speech, right? In purple, it says mixed speech. So, of course, according to that terrible concept of national self-determination, you have to sort out populations, right? And you're sorting populations in the American imagination on the basis of nationality, reduced to language. So this was an enormous problem. I think Bowman understood how badly maps became arguments, weak arguments. Um, especially if you had the case where you needed to draw monochromatic maps. I'll give a couple of examples of these. If every map was an argument, there are, of course, very dangerous and exclusionary nationalist arguments to almost every map. Um, who started it? Well, you know, certainly Rudnitsky drew some maps as well. The one at the left is a propaganda map um, drawn by Romer in 1917 the captive nation of 30 million Poles. The one at the right is um, probably by the second most important geographer of Ukraine's 20th century, Volodymyr Kubiyovich, author of the Historical Atlas of Ukraine, published in 1937. Kubiyovich, I'm still waiting for a biography of him, a critical biography of Kubiyovich, talking about his world um, his world in the SS Galitsyn, his world uh, in drawing um, the Atlas, and of course his editorial work with the Encyclopedia of Ukraine. The one at the bottom, of course, might be familiar to you. I don't know how many of you in the lead bother to watch Russian propaganda channels anymore, but this is what the Kremlin did, in fact, a week before the Crimea annexation. This is a map, um, I write about it in a piece that's coming out in Berlin. Uh, it was published on, it was appeared on Arte uh, on March 8th, 2014. Other arguments. Um, I talk a little bit about the ethno schematization of nationalities, the breaking down of nationalities into single colors. Usually the dominant color is red or pink. So if you see a group, Here's the signal, for those of you who are into, you know, like abstract expressionism um, from Kandinsky to Rothko, when you see a map in red, when you see a map in pink, it usually means the dominant nationality. It's the prejudice of the cartographer. There are other examples of this. Uh, I mentioned the in most influential um, sort of popular geography book published by Rudnitsky. There's a very interesting story about this. I also tell it in my book. Um, Rudnitsky's Ukrainer und die Ukrainer was originally written in Ukrainian. 
before 1914. Um, the publisher lost the manuscript. The publisher's name was Lam. It was a firm, a publishing firm here in, in Lviv before 1914, Lemberg-Lvuv. Um, Ruditsky rewrote it. It came out in German. He wrote it in German. It was translated into English. Here are some of the maps, or here's one of the map from um, probably the most influential sort of popular geography book about Ukraine during the war. Um, in fact, during World War I, Rudnitsky's books about Ukrainian geography sold about two million copies. Other arguments, just very briefly through these, and I want to get to Teleki and, and hopefully draw some concluding points about map men. I mentioned that map makers need patrons, largely because maps, at least in the paper era, were so expensive to produce. Um, virtually every atlas was a collaborative project. And so political patronage becomes especially important. Here at the right are the patrons of Poland. But of course, they're not in agreement about where the borders of Poland should be. This takes place during the Paris Peace Conference from January to June of 1919, um, followed, of course, by the Polish-Ukrainian War. So the friendship between Bowman and Romer is incredibly important. It's Romer who quite literally is knocking on the hotel door at the Hotel de Crillon in Paris um, to give Romer more maps to make Poland in March and April of 1919 appear as large as possible, right? And that includes the incorporation of Lvov, and for that matter, of Vilna, Vilnius as well. Other arguments that came out of this time frame, um, one of the things I'm really proud about uh, with Mapman is um, I learned Hungarian in order to write the book, Magyarul. And um, I found some amazing materials uh, in the work of Count Paul Teleki. Uh, there is a, a wonderful Hungarian historian named Balac Ablonsi who uh, wrote the first sort of real critical biography of Teleki in Hungarian. It was translated into English. I went back to the original Hungarian to find Teleki's letters, um, his maps, his correspondences. Um, he actually. Um, Teleki did as the Prime Minister of Hungary and as a trained geographer, the author of this uh, Carte Rouge, Red Map. Um, he had a number of correspondences with geographers uh, like Bowman in order to advocate for an enlargement or revision of Hungary's territory. So this was a map, uh, the ethnographic map of Hungary. Um, it was modeled on, on the work of some French geographers at the turn of the century, um, but it was an incredibly important and influential work, both uh, in terms of its science and propaganda during the war. Um, I talked a little bit about the revisionist cartography in the 1920s and 1930s. The idea of maps as bodies or maps as geobodies, if you read the work of the um, Thai historian Winichapal Tung Chai, um, or the post-colonial Indian historian Sumati Ramaswamy, uh, they offer a number of very interesting ideas about the borders of maps as layers of skin, and the idea of the penetration or um, interpenetration of ethnic others, ethnic groups. I think this is especially important as we study um, the history of migration and mobility uh, into the 21st century. But anyway, these were some of the graphic designs of maps in the 1920s, um, which came out in Hungarian. Um, just to finish the story uh, from my argument about um, maps in red and maps in pink, and maps at the intersection of science and propaganda, there were many other examples of red maps, or carte rouge, and in the 1920s and 30s especially, they became tied to what I call Ostsiedlung fantasies, the idea of living space, colonial settlement space in the East. Um, you see this effect, the kind of a thrust, a push of the maps spreading eastward. The first map is a map of nationalities in Poland, which was um, produced by Romer and his assistant 
Shimansky. Uh, the one at the top is the most famous map associated with Albrecht Penck. It became streamlined into the German school system. So uh, this is a map of um, Volks- und Kulturboden. Uh, it was very popular among those who are not only attacking Versailles, the Treaty of Versailles, but also the Lucarno Pact in 1925. Penck was among the revisionists. This was a map which was drawn by uh, his associate. His name was Arnold Hillen Ziegfeld. Um, but this map uh, is the map that's most associated with Penck in 1925. Uh, and toward the bottom is, uh, of course, a Nazi map from 1937. I don't really have time to talk too much about the Third Reich, but I talk about it in my book. Um, as for Rudnitsky, I think um, his legacy lives on. Um, the story of Rudnitsky is quite tragic, I think. Um, he could not find an academic position after World War I. He taught at Charles University for a while until um, he made a very fateful decision, as did many Ukrainians in the mid-20s, to relocate to Kharkiv. So, um, Rudnitsky in 1925, um, this is actually after the death of his wife, but he decides as a scientist and as a geographer to go to Soviet Ukraine in Kharkiv in 1925-26 in order to kind of create a geography school. Um, and of course, you know, this doesn't happen, right? Rudnitsky imagines himself carrying the legacy of German and Austro-Hungarian Central East European cartography. Um, once Stalin comes to power in 1928, Rudnitsky is slowly but surely stripped of all of his academic credentials and titles. Um, he's unable even to found a geography journal because that would mean the independence of, of Ukraine outside of the Soviet orbit. Um, Rudnitsky was not a communist. In fact, never had been, was not a Marxist, was not a Leninist, was very much trained in the old ways of colonial geography. And so Rudnitsky is arrested in 1933. He's charged with counter-revolution and fascism. And he is killed um, together with 266 other members of the Ukrainian intelligentsia at Solovki, the Solovets Islands, in 1937. So these are some of the legacies. Um, we see, in fact, even the style of ethnographic mapping and ethnographic cartography from the middle of the 19th century all the way through works by people like um, Piotr von Keppen and Karl Schoenig for the um, Habsburg Empire, all the way through into the work of Kubijovich. This, in fact, um, here at the right, was a map from the Encyclopedia of Ukraine. Um, this is the Canadian edition, so this was the one that was published um, in Toronto in 1968. Okay. So I want to conclude now um, with some final thoughts about MacMen. Who were they? And what were they about? What, what did they do? What did people like Rudnitsky represent? Map men may be defined as a coterie of professionals. They were both men and women, but none were feminist, at least not before the 1950s. Not for the ones I'm studying anymore. They longed in old-fashioned ways for power and personal bound, bonds, while trying to fulfill generational dreams of security and adventure, so characteristic of a roving intelligentsia of experts. Our protagonists learned how to speak map. Map was a language, like Esperanto or Yiddish, to speak map, required a certain talent. These men, Rudnitsky included, became world-class exhibitors of map-related map tools. 
the interest in MAP was not just scientific, but also pathological, emotional. Why people loved maps and why people feared maps was sometimes one and the same thing. Those who grew interested in maps often saw maps as a sign of frustration, unfulfilled personal ambition, along with a host of other emotions, fear, rivalry, anger, petty jealousy, and above all, resentment. These emotions beneath the colors and between the lines nestled inside provincial worlds like Galicia, larger transnational worlds like Central and Eastern Europe, and contradictory and closed professional worlds, closed professional worlds of privilege, learning, and authority. Now, academics often use the word criticism or critique. We like to think that we're standing apart, independently as intellectuals, critiquing power. But these geographers were imbricated very deeply in imperialism and nationalism. They replicated power. They mirrored power. They echoed power. My story of map men, I think, is a story of what happens before the digital age of maps, in which, if you go on Twitter, I'm on Twitter, cardophilia is everywhere. And that's what makes it so dangerous. Maps in the 21st century seem like sublime tools of progress and essential for education, for textbooks, for atlases. We remain suspicious of them. We know they lie, how to lie with maps. But we also think they can do anything, if only designed more persuasively, to build communities. Maps are on Facebook, Twitter, and other social media. Popular sites include Map Porn and I Fucking Love Maps. Maps are in the future. By the way, I know both of the founders of those, so that's a scary thing. Maps are in the future of GIS studies, in the gaming industry, and on every phone app. But these are fads, or illusions as fads. Smart historians, in looking at the history of cartography, must do more than click the bait blindly share images, and read maps literally. Nor can we say, in the world after Maidan, with partnerships and diplomacy being so delicate, that all maps are rational. Of course not. But neither are all maps simply out there for people to be conspiratorially manipulated. As we've seen from our map men, Teleki, Boma, Romer, Pink, and Rudnitsky. The projects and dreams and categories of maps fail. Lines are not fixed. Nations are not eternal. Maps, as Jean Baudrillard wrote about in a cliche in 1981, precede territory. Maps come before territory. Just interview any real estate magnate and you can find that out. Maps precede war. And the maps of East Central Europe are dangerously, dangerously, dangerously shipped around on media channels faster than I can keep up with them with purpose and unintended consequences. Countries get erased when no one is watching. Thank you. Thank you so much for this great uh, and bright representation. Thank you, and I encourage you to ask questions.
or share your impressions uh, of this uh, lecture. I believe I have the first question to ask. It's a very interesting question you mentioned uh, in your presentation about the peculiarity such as in many cases your protagonists also showed anti-semitic views even more so in their practices they never even uh, marked the Jews on their maps so my question is what about other ethnic minorities what was uh, the broader practice beyond this uh, coterie of experts uh, and uh, which methods should have been used to mark the Jews or maybe others had other suggestions? What about also the relevance and importance of Jewish ge geographers, how they approach the Jewry in Europe and or maybe other ethnic minorities as well? Uh, but I'm going to try in, in English, it's probably. Um, I think the question of visibility and invisibility of minorities is an especial, a special problem for studying the history of Central and East European cartography. So yes, there were Zionist maps. Yes, there are maps in both Yiddish and Hebrew. Um, they're extraordinarily interesting. But for the most part, the geographers who emerged from the ethnographic tradition of European geographical societies, they usually marked Jewish populations in black, Yevrei, or left them out completely. There are several reasons for this. For Rudnitsky, I think, for him in drawing a larger map of Ukraine, his model for Ukraine was a Nationalitätenstaat. So Austria-Hungary, at least since 1867, with the autonomy of Galicia, and before that, back to 1848. The first ethnographic maps that came out were in the 1830s and 1840s. The next most important wave of the maps that came out were between the 1870s and 1890s. Um, and I think really one of the most important Ukrainian maps is by Krikori Velichko, which comes out in 1896. So, Tipichna, typically, Jewish populations are not regarded as part of Ukraine in those ethnographic maps. Not, not always. For Rudnitsky, his ethnographic model of Ukraine would include all of the languages of all of the peoples of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Now, here's the problem. Does the fact that you are not marking Jewish populations by nationality mean that you are drawing an anti-Semitic map? I would say yes and no. This is so complicated. Um, because the acknowledgement that Jewish populations are by essence their language, if it's Hebrew or Yiddish, is also an othering of Jewish populations to the point where one denies their ability to assimilate, acculturate, and perhaps, um, in a secular sense, acculturate 
to German, to Hungarian, to Polish, to Russian, and to Ukrainian. So for Rudnitsky, just as an example, I write about the question of um, anti-Semitism and Ukraine. Rudnitsky absolutely supported intermarriage between Ukrainian language speakers. And he writes about this in the 1930s. Um, Romer, just to use another example, who I do not think was an anti-Semite, um, in fact, his brother was married to a Ukrainian and she became Polish by language and, and religion. She was a Greek Catholic. These geographers who came out of Galicia, Western Gal and Eastern Galicia, I do not see as particularly anti-Semitic in a racial sense. But they drew racial maps. In the German sense, if one goes farther west, so um, again, I write about this in the book. The books that, or the maps rather, that come out among German-speaking geographers and cartographers in the 1920s out of Berlin and Leipzig, and then during the Third Reich by people like Emil Meinen, who was Penck's student, are absolutely anti-Semitic. They're anti-Semitic in a racial sense because they agree with the Nuremberg Laws, um, forbidding intermarriage between um, so-called Aryans and so-called Semites. And those maps, I think, are even more complicated because in the German case, some of them are conservative, colonial maps, folkish maps, so German colonial maps or German imperial maps. And then there's a second kind of imperialism and colonialism in Nazi maps where the primary category of othering, othering, separating, differing, is by race. So um, if I can answer this question, I think, and I try to answer this in a very honest way with German, Hungarian, Polish, Ukrainian, and Russian cartographers, I think the anti-Semitism of these cartographers is often a matter of degree. Um, by far the most anti-Semitic maps that I've encountered were in Hungary in the 1920s and 1930s. And the reason for this in the Horthy regime is because anti-Semitism was institutionalized in Hungary before it was institutionalized in other countries in Eastern Europe. So the numerous clauses, for example, which was the way to prevent Hungarian Jews from joining the professional classes, from becoming part of the technical intelligentsia, becoming doctors, lawyers, teachers, academics. This started in 1919 and 1920. There isn't a Ukraine here to talk about an institutionalization of anti-Semitism at the state level. So the anti-Semitism one finds in maps has to be treated at the level of circulation rather than at the level of production. Um, I hope that answers some of the question. I'd be happy to talk about that some more. Принаймні, угорська мапа, одна, яку ви показували, вона трохи відрізняється від інших, тому що вона має в собі такі білі плями, тобто вона не, не зовсім симпліфікує ситуацію і не тільки показує, скажімо, такі чіткі кордони однозначно домінуючої нації. О, oh, I love that question. So, look at the white spots on this map. Um, I think what's really interesting about this Carte Rouge is the use of population density. So 
the major unit of measurement for the Carte Rouge is population density. And of course, as anyone who's ever drawn a map according to population density knows, the scale is absolutely arbitrary, right? What is it that constitutes a village, a town, or a city? How do I determine, according to population, what is a city and what is a town? Yes, that's cool. The white spots on the map were very cleverly drawn, um, both to minimize the visibility of Romanians. The Romanians are in the purple orchid shade. And to minimize the populations along the border. This is an incredibly useful cartographic trick. You know, I think of map men as um, magicians, magic. Like, th this is a kind of alchemy. Because it was the same technique used in the history of the United States in the 19th century to erase Native American populations. As white European colonial settlers pushed west of the Mississippi, and presidents, US presidents like Andrew Jackson, um, the president admired by Donald Trump, um, increasingly pushed um, Native Americans out through violence onto res reservations. These were the kind of maps that were used to minimize presence. Now, this is an interesting argument because it's in many ways different from the German fear of population density and Slavic populations constituting an Eastern threat. So, in German maps, you see a different kind of logic, um, especially in um, maps dealing with Silesia and other borderland questions after 1919. So German cartographers pose the threat of migrants coming in across the border. You know, like the, the, the larger population of people moving in, migrating. And so therefore, they had to exaggerate the numbers to make the numbers higher rather than lower. This is how maps lie. I have a question. Thank you very much for an interesting presentation. And uh, I have a question about your conclusion about this close interrelationship between uh, geographers and geography and uh, politics, nationalism, imperialism. And if you look uh, at this issue from a disciplinary perspective, I am historian and uh, I teach history of historiography and uh, we can see more or less the same situation within the historical profession at that time, uh, late 19th, early 20th century, so history was also closely interrelated with nationalism, imperialism, but at the same time within the historical profession there was a criticism of this partisanship Mm -hmm. of this bias, there was the idea about history for history's sake, about objectivity, and so on and so forth. And it became especially strong after the uh, World War I. Uh, uh, can you see anything similar within this geographic profession? Was any criticism of this partisanships of geographers and uh, contribution to this, to this nationalistic and imperialist causes at that time. Maybe you could elaborate on that. Yeah, um, thank you for your question. I, I think, um, as a historian, and as a historian of geography, I'm very interested in schools of thought. So, how did the discipline of geography evolve? How did other fields and subfields of geography become popular? And why, at a particular moment in time, 
did one particular um, discipline or sub-discipline of geography become more popular than another? This sounds very abstract, but let me give a, a very concrete example of this. So we could talk about the influence of Friedrich Ratzel. Friedrich Ratzel is responsible for the term Lebensraum. Friedrich Ratzel was the inventor of modern human geography. But it was not called human geography. It was called Anthropogeographie. So, when Rossel began writing about colonial geography, colonialism, he was obviously, in the 1890s, 1900s, very much a supporter of European imperialism and colonialism. Um, the founder of British geopolitics, Halford Mackinder, um, was certainly a supporter of making the British Empire extend with its mandate system after World War I. So the geographers are, are very much a part of this project of empire. And it's a project not just of, of nationalism, but a project of empire. Back to Ratzel. Ratzel, like Pink, has an impact, has an influence, which is an enormous impact on American geography, just to give one example. He also has a huge impact on Hungarian geography, and maybe um, Nadia could answer this, but a lesser impact on Ukrainian. The reception of Ratzel is so fascinating because Romer, who knows German, who studied at German universities, who speaks German, creates a Polish national school of geography um, sorry, the gods are coming to get me. Um, in many ways, on a parallel track, Romer's School of Geography in Poland is created like Rudnitsky's School of Geography is created in Poland. Here's the difference. Romer has the technology to make maps. Um, and so, in the visual arts, Romer is actually able to use all of the discourses of science, objectivity, for the cause of Polish independence. Whereas Rudnitsky, because he doesn't have a university, and in fact doesn't have a state, much less a commercial firm for producing graphic images, it is, is somehow in a corner. He has to rely on the diaspora, which as we all know, in the Ukrainian diaspora, well, it, it's, it's, I shouldn't say it, but it's not reliable. <laughs> it is and it's not, right? Um, and in the diaspora in the 20th century, that's where Rudnitsky's influence is so profound because he's arrested in 1933, killed in 1937, completely forgotten about, you can't publish his maps, right? You can't publish Ukraina or anything about Ukrainian geography. Um, I researched his family. He had two children with, who were lost um, as part of the purges. Um, you know, uh, his work was not um, published until after the fall of communism, so after 1991. And, and I think it's the job of historians then to try and go back and look at schools of thought or historiography. So what I do with Rudnitsky is kind of create an alternative history. I know it has a bad name. But what if, what if Rudnitsky was able to be the professor of geography at Ivan Franco University starting in 1908? Um, what if Rudnitsky did not make a decision like Khrushchevsky made a decision to move into Soviet space, into the Soviet Union? What if Rudnitsky had not decided to go to Kharkiv in 1925, 1926? Um, would there have been a Kubiovich? Well, probably. Would there have been an Encyclopedia of Ukraine? Well, probably. 
But all of those different schools of thought in the earth sciences, climatology, astrogeography, glaciology, um, I think they would have developed along a different trajectory. I'm not sure what that is, but I think it would have been a little bit different in the 20th century. Um, soil science is a, is a great question, too. You know, um, The Belarusian geographer, who was my sixth map man, I had to cut from the book. Um, he was an advocate as a social democrat for Belarusian independence. Um, he worked for the Hromada. Uh, you know, but he, as a soil scientist in the Dokuchayev tradition, was also um, arrested uh, in 1931. He was in his 40s. He lost his academic credentials. Um, the family was um, shipped eastward. He was ultimately arrested and, and killed in 1938. So anyway, I'm trying to think about, I think your question is a good one. I'm thinking about schools of thought. Um, for each of these geographers. You know, one more footnote to this. Um, Romer survived World War II hiding in a monastery. At, um, the monastery was the Zmartvichstansov monastery in which he hid um, from, eight, from 1941 to 1944. He lived all the way until 1954. Um, both of his sons became very prominent in the technical intelligentsia, in Poland's technical intelligentsia. Uh, one became a professor in Gliwice, in Gliwice. Uh, as for Pank, you know, he died in 1945 at the age of 87. Um, writing his memoirs, some of the last letters he writes are to the Swedish geographer Sven Hedin, talking about how Hitler is uh, an instrument of peace. Anyway, um, these are some of the stories. I, I can't really talk about all of them, but there's some of the stories I, I bring up in the book. Um, Bowman, <laughs> Bowman, as far as a school of thought, he, I think, is the least influential of the five that I discuss, and I, I'm actually very happy about that, that he's not very influential. Um, he was not just anti-Semitic, um, he was anti-Semitic, but as the president of Johns Hopkins University from 1935 until 1948, um, I found this in his papers, in his letters. Uh, he actually um, actively prevented the enrollment of African Americans um, in American, in, at Johns Hopkins University for almost 15 years until his retirement in, in 1948. He was, you know, anti Semitic anti-communist, um, anti-Ukrainian, <laughs> um, but, you know, uh, the stories of these are, I think, uh, stories of, of the dark history of, of geography and cartography. Not, not just, you know, the optimistic projects and the beautiful maps, but uh, there's a darker side to this. Thank you for your presentation. My question would be a little bit different one. Uh, I always imagine that uh, to, to make a map, well, you need a whole institute of people rather than one person. Uh, so what would be other like um, institutions, organizations, or societies? Who else would be involved? Not just one ge geographer, but, but who would be influential in this? Um, Ukrainians need Harvard. <laughs> yeah, and do you accept that, that like, like this, uh, I, I don't mean like a, the, um, yeah. the financing, but, uh, but in, the, in the producing of them. I, I think it's a great question, um, because it's not just one person who makes the map. Um, it, it's often one person in the digital world now who, who makes the map, or who posts the map, and who circulates the map. Maps go viral in the digital world um, because one person you know, clicks and then it goes off into the universe. But I, I think in this particular period, especially in the world of nationalism and imperialism, the high age of territorial nationalism and imperialism, as, as the historian Charles Meyer writes about, 
is you know, roughly from, I would say, the 1830s or 1840s until the 1970s, maybe early 1980s, the end of the British Empire, Falkland Islands Wars is sort of where I would put this. And, and I think in this high age of territorial nationalism, you need an entire team of people in order to make maps. You need an entire team of experts in order to make an atlas. And the atlas not only has to um, pass censors, it has to be approved by the Ministry of Education, usually, because why else would you spend all of this money and all of this time? Um, the people who are working on the atlas, I think, have to be in some ways patriotic. One way or another, they have to believe in the project. And of course, there are different shades of nationalism and patriotism. Um, but if you're producing a hegemonic product, like most atlases are hegemonic products, if they're reducible to a nation or, or to a state, um, usually you need a whole lot of funding for that. And usually the funding has to come from the state. Now, what if the funding doesn't come from the state? This is a really important question. Um, there's a great project in France called the Anti-Atlas of Borders, and it's by a collaborative of anarchists. So, let's look at this from a completely different angle. Suppose you're an anarchist cartographer, you're an, anar you're an artist, and you don't want to write official propaganda with maps. You're actually working from below, in maybe in an organic sense or a grassroots sense, an activist sense, um, and you're trying to challenge people's conception of borders. Well, then you draw maps like this one in 1929. Um, let's say in Ukraine, you're part of a counter hegemonic collaborative group. This sounds very academic. But there was an, there was an exhibit um, at the Visual Culture Research Center, I remember seeing in Kiev uh, in 2015, I think it was, where there were a number of really interesting maps shown. And those maps were arguments against the reduction of Ukraine to a country between East and West, right? Or the reduction of Ukraine to some kind of civilizing object of desire between the United States and Russia, or whatever it might be, between um, the US and, and Putin. Um, so I, I think that there are ways of, of understanding how to be an activist in order to draw maps. You draw maps as jokes, humor. You draw maps not according to scale. Um, I remember this sculptor, he was an avant-garde sculptor by the name of David Cherny, brilliant Czech um, contemporary artist, sculptor, uh, who had this exhibit, I also write about it in my book, it's called Entropa, which is a joke about the European Union. And in this um, live happening, this sculpting of, of Cherny, he was commissioned by the EU to create a map. And instead, what he did was represent every country of the EU in a very kind of ironic, subversive way. So for example, um, Poland was represented, and, and I, hope, um, I hope this is understood in, in the proper way, but Poland was understood in Czerny's exhibit. Um, the image of Poland was of the soldiers for the Iwo Jima monument, raising the gay pride parade um, flag, raising the flag. Um, I thought this was fascinating. And, and I think um, Italy was represented as a soccer field with football players masturbating on it. You know, but this was a way to sort of like attack the official representations of nations. And, and, and I think, um, you know, you could ask, how, how do you represent Ukraine? Sweden was represented as IKEA furniture, which you couldn't put together. Switzerland was Toblerone chocolate, 
which was, you know, like giant and inedible. Um, Romania was a Dracula-themed amusement park. Um, I think these are some of the, the symbolic energies, if you will, or emotions or, or sentiments or attitudes which go into the maps. Um, this map of, of Hungary at the bottom is, you know, I think common to a lot of East European notions of the, the country as a body or the country as a cake, right? And people are grabbing from it, taking the cake. Um, one of the most famous renditions of the partitions of Poland Lithuania is the 12th cake uh, by the artist Lemire in, in 1773, where the partitions of Poland were, you know, um, Catherine the Great, Maria Theresa, um, like all, all taking food, all taking part of, part of the cake. So um, I think this is a really long way of answering your question. There's a team of people involved in this, but the team doesn't simply have to be a bunch of nationalist um, pedagogues and, and experts and, and those with, with the skill, the sort of data this skill set. I think there's also a very subversive quality to map making, um, and, and that's something I've tried to, tried to capture. One last question. Jay, I see you as a map man in the room, and I, I'm, and Marla too. Map man and map woman and, and map everything. Map, map, map family. So I'm just waiting. Moje pytanie może nie po temi. No u was tam na slajdach było na przykład o jakiej wybudowie zaraz. A Lviv nazywa tam na waszych slajdach był Polizm Nazwa. I zrozumiało, no Lev, czemu nazywa się Lviv, to muszę zasnował jego część syna swojego, Danilo, Danilo, tak, Karol Danilo. A czemu ono po niemiecki nazywa się Lemberg? No bo Lwów to wszystkie wszystkie lew, Lwów po rosyjsku też lew, a co ma wspólnego Lemberg z Lwową? Teraz piszą Lwów, tak? Ale Niemcy piszą Lemberg. Czemu? Może wy znajecie to, ja nie znam, bo ja wszystkich pytań nikt nie zna. Ale... Może ktoś wie, ponieważ... Nie, czemu ono nazwane Lemberg? I don't know the origins of the German name. I've actually thought about that because when people ask me what I call the city, I, I call it Leopold <laughs> or Leopolis. I think that because I, you know, want to be politically sensitive now, I always call it Lviv, and I think it is Lviv, it's a Ukrainian city. Um, when I come here, it feels like a Ukrainian city to me. And, and I come here because I like to come here. Um, I also want to understand all of the different um, aspects. Because I think the history of the city is nothing if not a multicultural history. Um, Germans refer to Lemberg. Read the book by Christoph Meek. Um, there's a book by Christoph Meek which is excellent on the history of the city. He's a German historian um, talking about the period from the beginning of the 20th century until after World War II. Um, the answer might be in there. But, you know, there's no question to me that Germans still have a colonial imagination. I don't want to essentialize it and general generalize it. Um, I think essentialism is quite dangerous, but the German maps of Ukraine are still very much colonial maps of Ukraine. The colonial space of, of Ukraine, the touristic space of Ukraine, um, Ukraine as an object for consumption, um, and that includes the city. It's a power relationship. Maps are about dominance and, and submission. Um, and one can definitely see that in the German case. Um, 
Did you, do you think it's also in your case or not? <laughs> oh, absolutely. I'm here as an agent of the CIA. Right? <laughs> I'm an agent of colonial empire. Um, the United States is an empire. I, I, I'm not here to help you. I, I think that's stupid. Help you with what? Um, you know, I, and it's funny because um, I'll just say this personally, you know, aside from the book, I, I first got involved in Ukrainian studies 20 years ago. Um, I had Timothy Snyder in my class. He was studying Ukrainian with me um, in the summer of 2000 at Harvard. And uh, I remember even back then having conversations with him because he was working on um, reconstruction of nations. And I, I read the book in its draft form, in its, its raw form, about how um, Americans should not be part of any civilizing mission anywhere. Um, I'm definitely not sure I'm here to teach you democracy. Because we don't have it anymore. We have elections. But that's not democracy. Any other questions? I, I, do, I don't work for the CIA. <laughs> but I, I'm part of the, you know, I'm, it feels like I'm part of the British colonial office. That would be my closest analogy. Um, or dispatched by the St. Petersburg Imperial Geographical Society. <laughs> there were plenty of people in the 1850s, 60s, 70s, who were dispatched by the St. Petersburg Geographical Society to collect information about Ukraine. I identify most closely with Pablo Chubinsky, circa 1872. He wrote a five volume collection of geographical information about Ukraine. But you had no chance to, because you said you had to cut something from your book. It's, it's a bit too big. Yeah. Well, in, that's right. In, in, in my first book, Mapping Europe's Borderlands, I, um, like a seance, I revived Chudinsky. Uh, in this book, Batman, I revived other dead white men. Um, but I think their histories actually are really important because they they need they need a different narration, a different narrative. It's not just a story of nations and nationalism. It's a story of exchange um, and power and emotion. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening. I invite you all to the